I have never in my life owned a dog. I am 22 years old and I've never had a pet dog. No, to be more precise, no one I've ever known has owned a dog. In fact, there aren't any dogs at all in the town I grew up in. Not a single person owns one. Not a single person owns one. And there most certainly haven't been any roaming the streets of the town either. Had it not been for the internet, I wouldn't even know they existed or could be kept as pets. Growing up, I asked my parents a few times about getting a dog only to have the subject dismissed or redirected. Each time, they would squirm uncomfortably, like I was asking about sexual positions or something, so I learned from their reluctance and awkwardness not to ask about it. At school, I had asked my friends, and they had told me their parents reacted in much the same way, though one of them, we'll call him Jimmy, claimed to have owned a dog once for a day or so before his parents found out. He had secretly brought it from an online seller. It was a yellow one with doughy brown eyes and droopy ears. But when his parents found out, they panicked. They shoved the poor thing out of the house with a broom like it was diseased before taking it away and returning without it. He said he didn't know what they did to it, but we both fell into an uneasy silence as we come to the same conclusions about what could have happened. For a while after that, I forgot about dogs. I stopped looking them up, and it wasn't until I started college that I remembered them. I happened to see a poodle walking with someone and asked a friend what it was. At first, she thought I was joking, but the look on my face showed her I wasn't, and she explained that it was a breed of dog. This reignited my interest, and I decided that at summer break, I was going to adopt a dog to go home with. Naturally, I was abuzz with excitement. I spent countless hours reading up on the best ways to care for a dog, how to train them, and more importantly, what to expect from a dog. Initially, I poured through breed references, trying to work out what breed was right for me, before realizing that if I got one from a shelter, it would be saving a life rather than ordering one. When the day finally arrived, I made my way to the rescue adoption agency, overflowing with excitement, only to have it evaporated when I actually saw the kennels. It was loud and smelly, with dogs barking and jumping up at the mesh caging that contained them. Basically, it wasn't all the free-roaming outdoor sanctuary I'd imagined it to be. To be honest, the way some of the dogs lunged at the wire scared me a little, and I instantly had doubts. Were my parents so afraid of dogs for this exact reason? Nevertheless, I made it almost right the way to the end of the cages before a dog caught my eye. He was a large, black and tan dog with no tail and attentive ears. He sat perfectly still and silent, only following me with his gaze. I knew right then that this was the dog I wanted. When I informed the adoption lady, she looked at me like I was crazy. Apparently the dog was an ex-car dog that had been adopted out twice before and returned for aggressive behaviour. She asked if I had any other pets or small children, though hardly seemed reassured when I told her that I did not. By now, I was a little mad at her, trying to convince me out of the dog I'd chosen and that only made me dig my heels in more. He was the dog for me. I was certain. When we got home, I named him Jasper, and we bonded instantly. He was already trained, and had no trouble following command. For me, he never showed any aggression. If we went out walking, and a stranger stopped by to talk to me, he would sit dutifully between myself and the other person. At home, he was perfectly mannered, only barked maybe once at someone passing by the house, and then never again. Jasper was wonderful, and I felt confident that meeting him would ease my parents' fears. He looked a little intimidating, sure, but he was really a big marshmallow, so when it was time for me to head home for the summer, I had no hesitation at all in taking him with me. 
However, when I arrived at the front door with Jasper by my side, I think my parents considered disowning me. My mother went pale and only just got close enough to give me a light hug before heading inside. Meanwhile, my father stood tight-lipped at the door, folding his arms in disapproval and stating firmly that Jasper was not to come into the house. Dinner was tense. We sat inside eating home-cooked roast, while Jasper sat outside at the glass door, waiting patiently until my father pulled the curtains shut to avoid seeing him sitting there. Did you have to? He was just waiting nicely. I complained lightly to mask my feelings of hurt. You shouldn't have brought that here, my father replied bluntly as he took an aggressive bite of his food, indicating that that was the end of the conversation. It was infuriating that no one would tell me why I apparently couldn't have a dog in the town. I started to think that maybe no one actually knew, that for generations upon generations, dogs were banned for some trivial reason that no one genuinely knew anymore. The rest of the evening went by in much the same manner. My mother was happy to see me, but concerned over the dog, and my father maintained his disapproving tone. However, it was after lights out that strange things started to happen. Jasper, of course, wasn't allowed inside, so I waited until I was sure my parents were asleep before I pulled on my dressing gown and snuck out to get him. I didn't really care if my parents found him still in my room in the morning. Perhaps then, they might even see that he's harmless. Outside, it was brutally cold, and I pulled my gown more tightly around myself as I softly called for Jasper. My breath steamed up in the air ahead of me, and I shivered in no time at all, which made me a little annoyed that Jasper wasn't coming to me with the usual speed I'd come to expect. Jasper, I called more irritably, straining my eyes to scan the darkness of the backyard. It wasn't a terribly big backyard, but trying to spot a black dog towards the back of it on the near moonless night was proving difficult. Then, a low growl came from the darkness. I felt a chill run down my spine. Jasper never growled at me, and I didn't know which thought terrified me more, that it wasn't Jasper growling, or that he was growling at something I couldn't see. Regardless, plucking up my courage, I said into the gloom, Jasper, it's me. My voice trembled slightly, a combination of the cold and my uncertainty. I thought then, that I could see the vague outline of Jasper standing a few feet away, so I took a tentative step forward. However, as soon as I went to move, I bumped into something. Startled, I realized it was Jasper sitting at my feet. He probably had been since the first time I called, and I just hadn't noticed because I was too busy staring at the shapes in the dark. Unsure, I looked back to the silhouette in the yard. It hadn't moved, but it wasn't gone. My breath caught in my throat, and I stiffly tried to shuffle Jasper and myself inside. I didn't know what was out there, and I also didn't want to know. Once we're inside, I locked the door securely and made sure the curtains were closed. When we returned to my room, I got back into bed, and Jasper curled up on the bed in front of my legs just as he always did. In my mind, I was already trying to dismiss what I had experienced. Jasper had just growled because he couldn't see me clearly in the dark, and the shape I saw was just because I couldn't see well in the dark either, right? That's what I told myself to get to sleep anyway. Unfortunately, it wasn't too long after I'd gone to sleep that I was awoken by Jasper, growling deep in his throat. Groggily, I turned to look at him, where I could see, in the light of my phone, that he was half sitting up, fixated on the door. I felt myself instantly begin to freeze up in fear as I followed his gaze. My door was open just a crack. Beyond it was pitch blackness. If there was anything there, 
I couldn't see it. But the hackles raising on Jasper and the dread building in my gut told me there was definitely something there. I had no idea what to do. I wanted to call for help, but couldn't take in a breath to form the words. It was a little ironic that in any other circumstance, I would criticize someone for doing exactly what I was doing and doing nothing at all. But in the moment, it's completely different, and I ended up merely slowly pulling the bedsheets over my head like a damn five-year-old. Let me tell you, it did not help. Not being able to see what was potentially coming to get me, knowing full well that it could, without a doubt, see my not-so-subtle lump under the sheets, provided no comfort at all. From my hiding position, I heard the door to my room creak open quietly, and then Jasper going nuts, barking, snapping and growling. I felt him launch off my bed and heard his nails scraping on the hardwood floor as he took off in pursuit of whatever had just entered the room. With all the commotion, my parents woke up and the overhead lights in my room flicked on bathing me in warm, safe light which encouraged me to come out of hiding. I sat up to see my parents standing in the doorway of my room. My dad had his shotgun at the ready with a grim expression, while my mother clung to his arm in a nightdress, looking terrified. Jasper was nowhere to be seen. After explaining what happened and traveling downstairs to see the back door open and a cold breeze blow in ruffling the curtain, I finally got the courage to ask what on earth was happening. This is when my father told me simply, dogs attract it. I don't know how long it's been now. I barely know what time it is. So much has happened and I'm starting to wonder if I'm entirely sane. I'll try to explain everything as best as I can in order. So, starting from when my dog, Jasper, vanished from my parents' house. My parents implied that something had come and taken my dog. There was a considerable amount of yelling after that. They wouldn't tell me what exactly had supposedly taken him, only blamed me for bringing Jasper to the house and in doing so, attracting it. They were mad I had put them in danger. Meanwhile, I was mad that they hadn't even been honest with me and still weren't being entirely forthcoming about what they thought was happening. I left the house in a huff, slamming the door behind me and storming off into the night, with my nightgown wrapped tight round me and my phone as a flashlight. Hours must have passed as I walked the silent streets. One thing about my hometown is that at night, it's dead silent. No crickets, no rustling of night animals. In other towns, you might see a stray cat or dog rummaging through the trash. Not this town. The only sounds were the soft scraping of my slippers on the concrete and the electric hum of the orange streetlight. Occasionally, I would softly call for Jasper and listen for the sound of padded paws coming towards me. But there never was. It was all I could do not to spook myself as I walked, though I stayed out there until the sun began to rise clean and crisp over the sleeping households of the neighborhood and just in time for my phone battery to die. I'm sure I must have looked crazed, wandering about as I was in my PJs, my hair a bird's nest of mess on my head and scraped up slippers from the distance traveled. When I made it home, my parents were making breakfast. To my surprise, they greeted me pleasantly, acting as if nothing had broken into our house and my dog wasn't missing, as if we hadn't argued and I hadn't just spent hours searching alone for him. In fact, when I tried to mention anything about it, they denied any knowledge of it, even going as far as to tell me I hadn't brought a dog home, that they had never seen or heard of Jasper. A new sort of anger boiled in me then. Their way of dealing with this was to just pretend nothing at all happened. Didn't I even ever knowing about Jasper? I couldn't believe it, but in my exhausted state, I just muttered a moody whatever 
and left it be. We ate breakfast in a tense state. They tried to make small talk, but I shut it down at most opportunities and then went for a nap. While I slept, I dreamt of Jasper. In my dream, I saw him running through the trees deep in the woods and then being dragged down a large hole into the earth, never to be seen again. This disturbed my sleep. When I sat up, I was a little disoriented to see that it was dark in my room. I had somehow slept the entire day into the night. Worse than that, in my confusion, I noticed the shape in the corner of my room. At first, I thought it was Jasper. In my half-wakeful state, the logic hadn't caught up to me that there wasn't any way he could have possibly gotten back into the house, let alone up the stairs, and through the door to my room. Still, the figure sat there. It was about the right size, and facing my direction, so that I could see its eyes reflecting back at me through the dimness. I called Jasper's name softly, but it didn't move. The hair on the back of my arms started to stand on end as fear crept into my mind. If that wasn't my dog, what was it? It was definitely an animal, in the right general shape. Or was it? The longer we stared at each other, the more I realized that although it seemed to have the high set eyes and round face shape of a dog, its silhouette was lumpy. There were too many limbs, its body too wide. Slowly, I began to reach for my bedside light, keeping my eyes locked on the creature. I heard the wet slop of its mouth opening and saw the pale mass of teeth as my fingers touched the cool metal of the lamp. It took a painfully long moment to actually find the switch as I fumbled with it. Panic was setting in, causing my heart to beat so fast that I could hear the blood rushing in my ears, and that only made me more desperate for light. However, as I finally flicked the light on, the thing in my room launched at me. I screamed and did the only possible logical thing I could think of. I pulled the blankets up over myself to stop it from getting me. I could feel its heavy weight on me as it grabbed at the blankets, trying to rip them off me. I thrashed wildly and fought back as hard as I could until I realized I could hear my mother's voice. Wake up! Wake up! It's me! Stop! She said firmly, and I realized with confusion that I was still dreaming. Gradually, I calmed and pushed back the sheet to see that it was broad daylight and my mother was sitting at the end of my bed with a nervous expression. What day is it? I blurted out, to which she answered, You've only been asleep an hour. We know you went on a little walk last night, but your father and I didn't want you to waste the day, she explained sheepishly. All at once, my uncertainty evaporated, replaced instead by renewed annoyance. I was way too exhausted for this. You're right. I have to find Jasper, I told her as I started to sit up. Oh, right, w well, she said awkwardly, patting herself off. The Garnets will be stopping over today for lunch. Best we be presentable and not mention such radical topics, she warned none too subtly. My mother always did have a way of dancing around her words while making the intent clear. I was to be home for lunch, dressed nicely, and not mention anything about a DOG, or heaven forbid. Once she had left though, I decided on making up some flyers and printing them off discreetly. I figured that surely, in a town with no dogs, that someone would notice if they saw him. The good thing about living in such a small country town was always that most places are within walking distance. The downside of course is that everyone hears about everything. As I made my way through the town, putting up my flyers, I noticed that they were being taken down. In some cases, almost as soon as I'd put them up, they'd be torn down. People in the streets glanced at me as I passed, giving me an unwelcoming side eye and whispering amongst themselves. It was uncomfortable to say the least, 
though it wouldn't dampen my determination or my anger. I felt that if my parents had just told me beforehand that Jasper would be in danger if I brought him here, rather than keeping secrets, none of this would be happening. Of course, though, I was also mad at myself. I had wanted to show my family that dogs weren't bad, that they didn't need to be scared of them, and that they were loving, wonderful creatures. However, in doing so, I'd put Jasper in a peril that I didn't understand, let alone know existed. It was selfish of me, and I couldn't forgive myself, but I was absolutely not going to give up on finding Jasper. I continued on my task until I ran out of flies and found myself to be wandering about without any real direction, just calling for my dog. It was only when I reached the edge of town and the beginning of the state forest that I stopped. Above me, the sun was starting to get high as midday approached, and in doing so, turning the day from pleasant to uncomfortably warm. So, I decided to take a break in the shade of the trees. Initially, of course, I had only intended on walking until I found a nice log to sit down on. But, I soon found myself walking deeper and deeper into the forest. The foliage was providing enough relief that despite there being beads of sweat on my brow, the air was cool on my skin, and this encouraged me onward. It's easy to get lost in a forest. You lose yourself in the crunching of leaves, the songs of birds, and the chirping of insects, so that before you even realize you don't know where you are, it's already too late. This is exactly what happened to me. Between one moment and the next, I became disorientated, so gradually that it seemed like no time passed at all. I knew I'd missed lunch, as I could tell it was now getting late into the afternoon, and it was as the sun hung heavy overhead that I spotted something unusual a little ways off. It was a tangled cluster of branches in a circular formation around the entrance of a hole in the earth. It looked like a combination of a bird's nest and a burrowing animal's tunnel. As I approached, I felt a sense of foreboding. I knew this place. It was the same place as it was in my dream. Was Jasper really down there? I approached it with caution, though even in broad daylight, there was something deeply unsettling about it. The way the branches were so purposefully twisted seemed wrong somehow, while the flattened grass and fresh soil around the entryway indicated recent activity. All of this, combined with the now silence surrounding me, put me on edge. I was caught in that moment of disbelief and mild panic, just waiting for relief to wash over me, as if I would somehow suddenly make sense of it, or see it for the harmless home of a rabbit or similar creature. But... As I stared at it, trying to make it make sense, trying to find a rational explanation, I realized there was none, and no relief came. Instead, I felt bile rising my throat as I noticed distinctly black dog hairs caught on the surrounding branches. Jasper was definitely in there, and I felt a wave of guilt wash over me. I didn't want to go in there after him. I really didn't. I stared down the tunnel for a long time as I argued between my sense of personal safety and loyalty to my dog. In those moments of decision, seconds passed as if they were years. Then, I heard it. The faintest of pained whimpers from within the abyss before me. And my mind was made up. Taking out my phone... I turned on the flashlight, then crawled into the tunnel awkwardly, holding the phone in one hand so that I was more army crawling with my elbows. The ground inside the lair was laid with sticks and twigs, just as the outside had been, but they had a damper quality to them, making them softer to wriggle over, and the air mildly humid. However, it was the smell of the place that most sticks with me now. There was the scent of decaying vegetation, which was unpleasant but bearable. And then, 
there was the more putrid smell of decaying flesh. I noticed small bones reflected back starkly in the light of my torch. They must have been old, though they all looked like animal bones. I couldn't say what kind of animal they had once belonged to. That is, until I turned a bend in the tunnel and came face to face with a neatly assembled pyramid of dog skulls. It wasn't a huge pyramid, but it was clear that many dogs had fallen victim to whatever this thing is. That thought alone was enough to make me sick, though what I saw next will scar me for the rest of my life. I had by this time travelled a good distance into the den. I tried to keep a relatively straight path, bypassing side tunnels in the labyrinth of openings so that I wouldn't get lost while still following the whimpering as my guiding force. After crawling for what felt like forever, it began to open out into a cavern and I found myself looking down into a pit of animal remains, some half eaten while others were bleached with age. Surrounding them was a stringy black substance with what looked to me to be eggshells. As I peered over the edge cautiously, I realized it wasn't a long drop down and I was confident that if I went down there, I'd still be able to get back up. So I began to make my way down slowly. Upon stepping down into what I assumed was a solid ground, I realized that the black ick I had seen from above and thought to be some kind of awful mold growing amongst everything, was in fact more like that of a giant spider's web. It had a sticky quality, and stepping on it seemed airy in that you didn't want to sink in too far, but also never hit a solid foundation, and instead sent ripples across it with each step, as if it was suspended above water. This made walking difficult, and I'd stumbled several times nearly dropping my phone in the process, before I finally was able to locate the source of the whimpering. It was to my relief and simultaneous disappointment. Not Jasper. Instead, it was a small Maltese cross of some kind, whimpering in fear and agony as it struggled in a sticky thread. The damp webbing stained its white fur in places and I wasted no time in trying to free it. However, as I manhandled the entrapping substance away from the poor thing, it began to writhe in an unnatural pain. I noticed beneath my hands and from under its skin, I could feel lumps raising up until they bulged large enough to push up the fur. The lumps were about the size of golf balls and to my pure horror, I realized they were moving. Something in the lumps was wriggling around. Disgusted, I recalled slightly. I didn't know what to do anymore. That's when one of the bulges popped, spraying a mixture of clear fluid and blood over the surrounding immediate area, including myself, and causing the dog to give a high-pitched yelp of pain. As the dog frantically struggled in vain to escape its pain, I saw that something was emerging from the fleshy crater. It was small and grotesque looking, covered in fluid after birth, it had six limbs, two sets of which were in a normal position for a quadruped, while the third set were perched higher up on the creature's rump. Its head was rounded with a short snout that opened straight into a mouth as if it had a hair lip and it didn't seem to have a nose. I froze in terror as the thing seemed to look around. Its eyes were small and forward set, but still closed. Somehow, I still feared it would see me, but a second one, popping out to the panic-stricken dog, caused the first one to shriek. It was a high-pitched cry of displeasure, as if its sibling was competition to it, and it turned and began to feed on the dog, ripping mercilessly. At hearing the first one begin to eat the second creature, also began to feast, as more of the lumps burst open to reveal more of these things. It was a bloody mess of screaming creatures and helpless wailing from the dog. With no way to help, I turned to flee, stumbling clumsily as I scrambled to get away. I hardly noticed that the clear liquid I had been sprayed with was now turning black 
as it reacted with the air. When I did notice, a few new surges of bile threatened to come up my throat. I was scrambling through what was undoubtedly years worth of afterbirth and the remains of their first meals. When I reached the shelf I had come down from, I was just about to throw myself up into it when something caught my attention. The web was vibrating at even intervals with the footsteps of something large moving across its surface. I rose a moment as a new wave of terror filled me. It was approaching from somewhere in the darkness, just past the reach of my phone's light. I could hear its skittery wet, unnatural gait so clearly I could almost see it with my ears. Then, I booked it. Somehow, my body had decided for me that I was going to run. I hauled myself up the small ledge and crawled like I was possessed back through the tunnels. Looking back, I realized it was pure luck that I went the right way, and the cool night air met me with a refreshing gust of pine-scented wind. I didn't stop there, though. I knew it was in there, probably realizing I'd intruded on its nest and it was now surely coming after me with vengeance. Knowing it was probably coming for me gave my feet wings. I ran as hard as I could, as far as I could, until taking in breath burned my lungs and my legs felt like jello. In the distance though, the trees I could see, flashing red and blue, accompanied by smaller white lights of torches scanning the forest. I made that my target to reach, and as I ran, I realized they were calling my name. They were searching for me. Somehow, in understanding that help was close at hand, my body gave out of me, and I fell into a crumpled mess, hoarsely calling to them that I was there. The following moments were agonizing as I waited for them to find me. Each time I called out, my voice was getting weaker and the idea that they might not find me, that they could instead give up and go home, leaving me there, was worse than when you're a kid and your parents threaten to leave you at the store. What happened next, I'm not entirely sure of. I remember delusionally hearing, I could hear a dog barking, then seeing a bright light flashing in my face and feeling something furry brush up against me. Then I woke up in hospital the following day. I was later told that, when I missed lunch, my parents were mad, but when I didn't come home by nightfall, they were panicked and called in the police to help them search. Apparently, they had just a bad feeling, and being friends with the sheriff for so many years had its benefits. However, they wouldn't have found me if it weren't for one thing. A dog. Specifically, my dog. As they were looking for me, They'd found Jasper in the woods instead, and he had kicked up such a stink by running off barking and then returning to repeat the process that someone had finally followed him to me. He was mostly okay, which I'm still thankful for. A couple of scrapes, but nothing too serious. I myself was dehydrated and scratched up from running headlong into the brush, though overall I'm okay too. I'm getting this all down from the hospital bed, as I'm waiting to be discharged, Jasper is by my side. Apparently, everyone is still afraid of him, so no one would come near him to remove him from the room. Tomorrow, I'll demand that my parents tell me everything they know about the things in the forest. For right now, though, there's just one thing now that bothers me. When I reached over to pat him a moment ago, my hand came back wet with just the faintest amount of unsettlingly familiar black fluid. In the days after I got Jasper back, things were simultaneously remarkably normal and unsettlingly abnormal. Of course, one of the first things I did was to take Jasper to a vet. The idea that he could grow exploding pustules that gave birth to horrific little beasts plagued my every waking moment. Thankfully, however, his vet scan was clean. In fact, the vet even remarked on how healthy he was. The relief from that comment was unbelievable. When I brought him home, 
my mother was horrified. Clasping her hands over her mouth to hide a gasp of surprise poorly as she scuttled away to get my father like a bad actress from a vintage movie. When my father arrived, his jaw was set firm, but all he asked was, Is it clean? To which I assured him that nothing was growing on the Jasper's skin. With that, I was surprised to remark that they actually allowed us to stay. They even insisted that Jasper remain inside now. I believe they did this because they realized that their only option at this point were to kick me out of the house or help me protect my dog. I guess that just goes to show that, despite their flaws, my parents do care for me and are willing to help as best as they can, even in the worst of circumstances. With this in mind, I decided to confront my parents about what they know, since it was obvious they had more information than they'd been letting on. When we sat down for dinner that night, I made my move, waiting until the opportune moment before asking, So, what do you know about the thing in the woods? I've seen its nest, so I don't think there's any point in dishonesty going forward. I tried to keep my tone unaccusatory and formal. In response, my mother reached for a wine glass, while my father choked down his mouthful of food as dignified as he could. You know, as parents, we only did our best to protect you from this, to keep you from growing up in fear like we did. My father began evenly. You don't have to know. You can leave with Jasper and not know. I understand, but I still want to know, I responded meeting my father's gaze calmly, though it was kind of a death glare that willed one to back down. All right, he agreed as my mother nervously glanced from him to me and back again. No one knows where it came from. The oldest town ledger suggests it dug its way up from the depths of the earth, but that's only speculation. Truthfully, we don't know as much about what it is as we would like to. We believe it's a mygalomorph and call it a Nancy, he explained as I listened solemnly. What we do know about it is that it feeds on dogs to begin with, lays its younger under their skin. The young hatch, eat their first meal, and then they come for larger prey. An infestation starts. At first, it's only one or two children, then it's one or two adults. It feeds, reproduces, and spreads. Are you saying there's been outbreaks before? I queried. Yeah, every so often someone is dumb enough to bring a dog into town, despite the warnings of others, and we end up with an outbreak, he said pointedly. Well, what happened last time there was an outbreak? I asked, ignoring the obvious shot fired. Last time, 54 people died before the winter set in. Then they just stopped coming. We found their bodies thawing in the spring and burned them. Why didn't everyone just leave town? They tried, but the damn things followed the town and ultimately, people couldn't afford to move the second time. Instead, a council was set up to monitor the situation and we adopted the rule of no dogs. As he finished explaining, I found myself at a loss for what to say. It seems stupid that people wouldn't just leave. But at the same time, he was right. Not everyone can afford to move their lives because of some oversized insect things. We finished dinner in an uncomfortable silence from then on, before going to bed. That night, I kept Jasper close and lay awake most of it. We had boarded up the windows and doors before it got dark. Though I could have sworn, I heard the sounds of skittering limbs trying to get inside on more than one occasion. When morning finally came, we were greeted with the news that most of our neighbor's family had gone missing. Now, I say most because the children and mother were missing entirely, but the father of the household was found, torn to pieces in the living room with only some pieces of him missing. No one said exactly what they truly thought had happened. They all mumbled half-heartedly about a home invasion, while pretending they didn't see the sticky black substance on the body. It was then that an unusual sense of guilt came over me. I felt as though 
I had caused this. After all, I'd been the one to bring a dog to town, and I'd seen the nest. I worried that I angered the monster. Imagined it and its hordes of offspring rising up like a great sea of writhing masses coming to take and consume every man, woman, and child. It's safe to say the regret and doubt were filling the gaps in my self-assurances when suddenly I had a thought. A very, very bad idea wormed its way into my mind. Kill it with fire. I mean, why not? I knew where its lair was. How hard could it be to blow it up? I turned from the nervous gathering of people and went straight to my task. No one noticed the determination of my stride or the resolve in my eyes, and that was just fine. I left Jasper at home with my parents, safe and sound, then went to the gas station and filled up enough cans of gas to buy him out. From there, things were surprisingly easy. I remembered exactly where the nest was and drove my car right up to it. One by one, I unloaded the containers of gas and started hauling them down the tunnel. Though, I can say with honesty, that once I was actually faced with entering the dark, dank hole in the earth, some of my bravado fizzled out. Knowing it was a spider-like creature made walking on its web that much more terrifying. Understanding it could probably feel the vibrations and could come racing up at me with unsettling speed to disembowel me at any moment wasn't exactly thrilling. Nonetheless, I made small progression dragging the flammable liquid down the hole further and further until I reached the main cavern. Then, I hesitated. This was obviously the area I needed to leave the most containers. But then I wondered if my neighbors were maybe still alive down there. Against my better judgment, I decided to check. I crept around in the darkness with my phone light softly calling their names, just as I had done with Jasper. It didn't take long before I felt as though I were being followed, and I turned around to see cat-sized monstrosities scatter out of the way of the light's beam. I began to tremble uncontrollably then. They were all around me in the darkness, only a hair's breadth away, just outside the smallest circle of light. The brightness was keeping them at bay for now, what if they got brave? Or worse, what if their mother decided to come over? Those were the thoughts I tried not to consider as I continued my search. I regret to say, however, that by the time I found my neighbors, they had already expired. Their mangled, half-eaten corpses were suspended in the webbing. The youngest, a girl of only eight, had been who I found first, her body had near fallen right on me, so that I had been face to face with a majoritative picked clean skull. The fleshy remains of her eye sockets will forever be embedded in my memory, that's for certain. That was the permission I had needed to turn back and leave the wretched place. However, as I neared the exit, the creatures formerly repelled by the light seemed to realize their prey was nearing and escaping and they began to hesitantly snatch at me. I scrabbled and crawled frantically for the exit while they unsurely squabbled amongst themselves. The best way I can describe it would be watching a young predator hunt for the first time. The uncertainty of exactly how to grab and subdue prey while jostling for the first bite was exactly how they behaved. This did little to keep my panic as I realized then that the mother was probably nearby, watching her young and ready to step in in case I began to really escape. Bearing this in mind, I forced myself to give it one last huge effort, kicking the vile things off as best I could, I scrambled wildly for the exit. With daylight in sight, I felt the web under me begin to vibrate with movements of something large and knew it was coming after me. With a renewed wave of adrenaline, I pushed myself harder and made it to the surface. I made it out mere seconds before the big one reached me and didn't hesitate to light the gas fumes right up. 
The woof sound it made as it took off was incredible. Apparently, the black stuff was highly flammable. Unfortunately, my victory was short-lived, as while the babies seemed to scream and burn, and Nancy still came for me. Its horrible form rising up, half on fire, but so full of pure hatred that it pressed on toward me with murderous intent. I hurried to my feet and sprinted for my car. At the time, I didn't have any plan. I just expected that the metal and glass of the car would protect me somehow. I was wrong. As I fumbled with the keys, it launched into the bonnet of my car, scratching the glass as it clawed frantically at me. However, as soon as I had the ignition, I floored the gas pedal. The car lurched forward as we crashed directly into a tree. Thankfully, in doing so, the creature was crushed between the tree and the bull car, leaving its lifeless body oozing a watery, reddish fluid that I can only assume was its blood. And the car totaled. The walk home was both satisfying and painful. I limped most of the way, actually, since the steering wheel crushed into my knees with a crash impact. Now, like many of you, I thought this was the end of it. I made it home, and council members confirmed the nest was gone. Weeks passed. Jasper got a medal for bravery, and the town slowly started adopting dogs. Everything seemed fine, until I went back to college. I had been absentmindedly listening to the news while I studied, with Jasper asleep beside me, when one headline caught my attention. Local family missing in suspected home invasion. The town in question was the one over from my hometown, and I couldn't help but notice the black, sticky webbing visible inside the victim's home. 